But Karen's been giving us some of your memorabilia. I, th I think she, about two years ago, she she found some things that you had on Purdue. Uh, yeah, there were some of my things and some of my dad's things. Exactly, exactly. And those were just real treasures, I think, for the archives. There were a lot of things that we hadn't seen before. Uh, there was a great little booklet on an opening for a building that I'd never Wasn't seen. That, something? that was amazing. Leave it to the civil engineers to do blueprints. That's exactly right. And that's the kind of thing that so many people would not have kept, you know, and it was very interesting. So when I found out from her that, you know, I could call you and talk with you, I was really excited. <laughs> Oh, I doubt that's true. <laughs> By the way, there was something about you and about Karen and the letters that she brought up here in the student newspaper today. In, in the exponent. Yeah. Yes. Did you yeah. see that? Yeah. That's great. Well, I think what I'll do is I've got about seven questions for you, and then, you know, feel free to, to interrupt me or, or tell me things that, you know, I don't think to ask because... I have just kind of a few things that I, I want to know more about, but you probably know a lot of other things that I haven't even thought to ask. So um, I'm just going to jump right in. And could you confirm for me, I have that your full name is Carl M. Snap Jr. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Yep. And you graduated in 1953 in home economics from Purdue? That's right. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you, Carl, for talking with me. I wanted to find out first, uh, did you grow up in Indiana? In Gary. In Gary. And, and so you did you always kind of know about Purdue, or was there anybody in your oh, family? Yes, my dad went. Your dad was a graduate here as well. Yes, okay. Yes, I've always known about Purdue. And had you always kind of intended to come here? Never, never had any thoughts about going anyplace else. Interesting. What, what what was it like whenever you first came to campus? I'm assuming that you probably had visited campus when you before you became a student. Well, yes, and my recollections of that are kind of misty, except for one, uh, it would have been 1948 uh, while well, I was a senior in high school, and Dad would be coming down for homecoming that would be his uh, I don't know 25th anniversary since he graduated in 23 and we went to the Purdue Michigan football game I, I just happened to remember that and so we were on campus for that but I don't I don't have any recollections uh growing up, of, of spending any time on the campus. We, we very possibly could have because my, my dad's parents lived in Lebanon, outside of Lebanon, and we lived in Gary, so if we would drive down to see them, we'd go through Lafayette, and I can't imagine we didn't take some side trips around the campus, but I don't remember them. Mm-hmm. Well, was it around 49 or so then that you would have enrolled? Yes, I graduated from high school in 1949 and was a freshman then in September of 49 at Purdue. Could you see any, um, I guess, any indication that the war had recently been affecting things on campus? Well, that sort of sunk in slowly. Uh, talking, uh, I was talking with Elisa, who wrote the newspaper article. Uh, she said, what did kids wear? I said, well, an awful lot of them wore khaki pants because that's what they got when they got discharged from the Army. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I can't say that I was that aware of, I mean, that was, what, four years after World War II was over. And uh, as I got more settled in, I came to know more people. My first roommate was 25 years old. Wow. He was a veteran and was in school on the G 
GI Bill. I can't remember thinking that was remarkable or not remarkable, but there it was. Did the two of you get along well? Sure. I've heard a lot that there was just a tremendous amount of crowding on campus during that time, especially with the GI Bill bringing so many students back. Well, yes, housing was just tight as a as it could be. Did you live in, I know you were um, in Delta Tau Delta, did you stay in the house? Uh, off and on. I, I pledged my second semester of my freshman year and moved into the house and then didn't make grades and then I moved out of the house and then I made grades and then I moved back into the house and then I was in the house for the next two and a half years. So where did you... Sorry, go ahead. I just stopped. Oh, I just was curious when you first came, um, were you in one of the residence halls? No, I was not. Uh, they were full. The uh, So I came down to Lafayette with a high school buddy, and with two high school buddies. One of them had a car, and we drove down probably in August uh, from Gary to look for a, a room to live in. Mm -hmm. uh, we looked as far away as Ninth Street Hill, a place where State Street runs into Ninth Street over in Lafayette, yeah. and uh, ended up not being able to find a room together. And so, and then about the same time, I got a uh, I don't know, lucky break. A, a, a friend had a friend knew about a room available in a rooming house on Salisbury Street, and so I lived there the first semester. Okay. Well, um, did you already know when you came to Purdue what you would major in, or did... did Gosh, no, I majored in agriculture. Oh, is that right? How did how did that change? My granddad was a farmer, and, and I liked that, and... Uh, decided agronomy would be a good career, and I enrolled in the ag school. And during the course of my freshman year, I realized that all of my classmates were years ahead of me on experience. They'd all ra been raised on farms. Oh. And uh, so I decided I'd get out of the ag school <laughs> and <get into laughs> something else. And of uh, uh, the son of a friend of my mother's had graduated from the home ec school the year before and was now working for Hilton Hotels as, a, as a, an assistant manager. And I thought, well, that's, that's nice. I think I'll do that. Mm -hmm. I've been accused of doing it because of all the girls. Well, it was a, quite a strategy, yeah. But that was not so. Well, I know that there were so few women on campus. I mean, they well, relative were relative to the number of men. Exactly. Yeah. Did you do you remember ever having any other men in your home at courses? One, yeah. So did it feel did it feel strange to be in a class with where you were the kind of standing out or? No. They were uh, the. Uh, my major was institutional management, and there were only six of us in institutional management, so we were pretty good friends, the five gals and myself. And then this one guy who took some courses, he had graduated in something else earlier, but wanted to come back and take some courses because he was going to open a restaurant. Oh, yes. Well, you were involved in a lot of different things while you were a student. I was looking at your yearbook uh, bio, biography and photo, and you had a, you were a member of a lot of different things. I'm curious, um, what stands out in your mind as, as the student club or activity that you have the most, I guess, vivid memories of? Well, the thing that took the most time was the debris. Uh -huh. You don't have a debris anymore, do you? No, unfortunately we do not, but we use the old ones all the time. Uh, yeah, they're a good resource. Uh, so I started working there my freshman year and worked there for four years, ended up be 
being one of the senior editors. And that, you know, we'd, we'd hit the, the office was in the basement of the union building at the time. And uh, I'd get down there between three and four, stay till 5.30 or six every day. That's, that's where I met my wife. Is that right? Susie, yeah. So she was part of the uh, editorial group, or what What was her... Well, she was a year behind me, and, she, and I was a, a junior editor when she was a freshman working on the yearbook. We just got along. That's great. I saw that you had a nickname of Scoop Snap in the yearbook. What does... I did? Yes, it says... Uh, <laughs> It says, oh, oh, it's really funny. I pulled up the page you were on, and it said, Scoop Snap is unexcelled at the backhand carriage return. <laughs> I, I know who wrote that. <laughs> Jim Fisher, who was the uh, editor that year, my year. That's great. They all, It also said that you had a very ethnic group in, on the editorial staff that year. <laughs> Do you remember um, Wanda Ratz and Don Judd? I sure do. So what was the roles of, of the different people? Did everybody do a little bit of everything, or how well, did we that? Had different, different, I was the copy, the senior copy editor, and so I was in charge of all of the, all the text in the yearbook. Oh, yes. And so we had, and, and then it was further broken down by departments, activities and uh, clubs and organizations and stuff like that. So within each one of those, there were people who wrote things and people who edited the things they wrote. And I was sort of the, uh, the organizer of all that aspect of it, the copy within the... There was a photography editor, there was a treasurer, uh, there was a, uh, oh, what else? Photograph, if I said photography, yeah. Uh, so we, I'd have to look at the at that two-page spread of the senior editors to see how many there actually were, probably a half dozen mm-hmm. of us. Well, I'm amazed that you juggled so many things because it looks like you were also involved with the exponent and the rivet. Well... I, I drew a couple of cartoons for the rivet because a good friend of mine was the editor and uh, I had these horrible cartoons that I drew and he published them. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then a, a friend in the, in the Phi Beta Phi house, a sorority sister of Sue's, uh, she and I co-authored column in the exponent that lasted about two weeks I think it's a weekly column on nothing in particular and nobody read it <laughs> so we just abandoned that but uh, in, in those days the exponent office and the debris office were about 15 steps apart and so there was a lot of intermingling of talent and helping each other they printed the, the exponent in their office right down there. They had a press. Oh wow! Was it, so that was they were those were all in the union basement then. Yeah. Okay. That's... If you go down the uh, uh, bah, 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 west, come in the west entrance of the union building and go down to the level with the cafeterias, and all the food services on. Mm-hmm. Go down one more level. It was down there. Okay. What about um, Skull and Crescent? Do you have any memories of how you got involved in that? Well, that was strictly a sophomore honorary for people who were in activities. And if you were uh, a sophomore and had uh, a position of some responsibility in any of the activities, you were sort of automatically voted into Skull and Crescent. Same thing with Gimlet for for juniors and 
seniors. Oh, uh-huh. Did you ever get involved with the Boilermaker Special, or was that just for the Reamers? No, that was the Reamer so project. The, did the Gimlets eventually join the Reamers? Did, did what? Did the Gimlets eventually join up with the Reamers? I have no idea. I think I... I were, were fraternity guys, and the Reamers were independent guys. And gals. Uh-huh. And women before Gimlet did. I don't know if Gimlet ever did. Huh. Well, I know that um, a lot of people have fond memories of the rivet because we have a set of the rivets that it's. it looks like it ended maybe in around uh, late 1960s. Wow, I'm glad it kept going that long. I know. I've seen some of the, the drawings in there, and they're pretty funny, so I'll have to look for yours next time. <laughs> no, well, mine aren't funny. They're horrible. <laughs> they were in 1953. Right. Well, um, I know that you mentioned that you have kind of a family ties to Purdue. Your father graduated here in 1923, and you met your wife here as well. Um, I know that you've had at least one daughter attend. How many other people? In- our, our son our son got his uh, bachelor's and master's at Purdue. Okay. Mm-hmm. He died in 1988. Oh, wow. I'm he was, sorry. He was an aeronautical engineer for Boeing. So was he, was, who was older, him or Karen? He's two years older than Karen. Okay. And what did she graduate in? Karen? Yeah. She graduated in, she had a math and statistics major in the science school. Okay. Do you have any um, other family who are thinking about coming to oh, Purdue? Oh, gosh. <laughs> My, or people that you're trying to persuade? Uh, my, both of my sisters-in-law, both of, all three of my brothers-in-law, uh, there are 11 of us all together at, at last count. Wow. Family. Any IU grads in there? Just my uncle. <laughs> because he was such a great uncle. Oh, well, that's good. I guess we can't all be perfect, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> what about um, sort of student traditions? There's so many traditions at Purdue, and I'm curious if there was anything that the students like to do when you were here that either they still do or maybe they don't do anymore. Well, let's see, traditions. Hello, walk. Oh, Yes sidewalk, an oval sidewalk in front of what was then University Hall. I don't know what it is now. So it is uh, It is still there. Is it? Mm-hmm. Dr. Goose Grave was there. I don't know if that's still there. It is. But the tradition was to say hello to anybody you encountered on that walk. And did most of the people do that back then? No. <laughs> they don't do it now either. <laughs> <laughs> uh there was a tradition about the lions. Oh yes. You know where I mean? Yes, lions I. So yes, close. I do. The lion fountain. Yeah. Let's see. There's something about kissing by the fountain, or even doing something more elaborate by the fountain. Yeah, I. I don't or remember. Midnight, uh, never clear on it. It was something about the lions roaring. I can't remember exactly what it was either, but I've read about that. I think it will make something up and swear it's true. There we go. Who's going to question it, right? (laughs) What about the the, uh, well? I guess you'd say the uh, Boilermaker Special was a tradition even then, because it was in its second or maybe third. Rendition then second, I guess. Sudebaker originally provided the chassis and all the mechanical stuff for it, as I recall. Did they um, did they take the Boilermaker Special out around campus and in the local community then, or did they just bring it out for the games? No, they did. They had it out uh, to to uh, promote the games. 
you know, like Thursday and Friday before a game, it'd be going around picking up people and taking them around and just kind of hyping the campus. Mm-hmm. Did they have uh, the... Go ahead. Oh, I was just curious, were they, were students wearing senior cords when you were here? Oh, yes, I had some. Yeah? What did, what did you decorate yours with? Uh, I, I didn't. Somebody, the, the tradition was the freshmen tried to find the seniors' cords and paint them up ridiculously. <laughs> the seniors tried to hide their cords where the freshmen couldn't find them. And I was unsuccessful at that, so I had I can't even remember what I had on mine. Somebody else painted it on it. I didn't. Oh, that's funny. And then you had to wear them, or? I didn't have to, but we did. <laughs> what about um, the senior canes and the hats? Did they? Did you have those? The, the what? The canes. Some of the senior canes. Uh, and... That was more of a decorative thing. So uh huh. We had on uh, uh, homecoming day. Uh, the homecoming parade. I get homecoming and gala week mixed up. You don't have gala week anymore. No, but that was a that big was a deal. Springtime reunion thing. Right. Uh, but I guess it was at homecoming. It, 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 you buy a, a cheap black derby at the costume store and wear, wear a, carry a bamboo cane. <laughs> Not everybody did that, but enough did it that it wasn't unusual. Did you ever have parades for students, like in the in the town or things no. like? No, uh-huh. not that I recall. When I was a freshman, it was probably the last or second to the last year that freshmen were expected to buy green beanies, mm-hmm. little, little skull caps with a small beak on them. That were bright green yes that were indicative that you were a freshman and, and those, I, uh, I've seen those yeah so you didn't have to I don't think I had one. Oh, that's nice maybe they stopped getting strict about it after the war years or something yeah it got to be you know there were a bunch of 20 something year olds and that was sort of childish to them so right those, some of those time-honored traditions went by the wayside. I could see how that... (laughs) Yeah, exactly. What about um, after graduating, did you end up pursuing hotel management, or did you go a different way? Well, I did. I went up to uh, Michigan State to enroll in a uh, uh, an internship. They were going to have eight interns Michigan State had, have you ever been up there? Not, no, I don't think I have. Well, in 1952, I think it was, Michigan State built a hotel on campus for their hotel management students to run. And uh, in conjunction with that facility, they were going to have a, a, an internship program for eight interns, and they would each... It would be a one-year program, and you'd spend one-eighth of your year in each of the eight departments of the hotel. And so I went up there right after I graduated, was accepted into that program. But the program never got off the ground because they couldn't get eight people to come oh. do it. So I spent that summer being the breakfast cook at that facility. And then I was going to get drafted, so I came back down to, to Purdue and to be with my honey. And a month later, I was drafted. Well, in the Army, I taught cooking. Oh. Almost two years. When I got out of the Army, I came back and worked at Purdue for eight years in the residence hall food service. And ended up being the food service director at uh, Tarkenton Hall. Oh, that's interesting. Before I left that job and went to work for a company that managed food service for colleges and hospitals and employee dining facilities. What was it like coming back to be a staff member at the university where you'd been a student? It's, it's hard to keep them separate in my mind. Mm-hmm. It, it was 
was, uh, you know, I, well, I had two years in the Army behind me, and I felt like a young adult instead of a student. Mm-hmm. What's I part, was. <laughs> was part of your role thinking of, like, nutrition and menus, or what did you, what was in... T- well, the, the procedure then was all the men's residence halls and all the women's residence halls separately had a uh, food service program mm-hmm. and, and a food service director over the whole over each one and there would be uh, monthly meetings to plan the menus for the following month and uh, nutrition per se was not such a big factor of that planning because if you planned a you know what was considered in those days a square meal you had good nutrition Mm -hmm. and and so then that's all changed a lot I mean that whole organization has changed a lot now you could as a student in a residence hall you could only uh, the meals that you paid for were only those in the you, you paid a board bill, room and board bill, and the only meals you could eat were in your residence hall. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that has changed quite a bit. You're right. It sure has, yeah. I don't you think can, the I don't think no, the, you can eat any place. Can I know. I was just thinking, I don't, I don't think the students today realize how lucky they are. <laughs> yeah, well, everything that was changed was changed to accommodate students' uh, changing needs, and it was nicely done absolutely what um if you had to say like how you feel purdue made an impact on your life whether it was a student or or a staff member or as an alum what would you how would you characterize i guess the way purdue um, made a difference or for good or for bad for you oh that's hard to describe once a boilermaker always a boilermaker (laughs) yes that's for sure we have such loyal alumni here. It's amazing. It's, uh, I don't have very many friends left from Purdue. Uh, just lucky to have lived this long, I guess. There's the one guy I said that had written that line about me in the debris, he was the editor. He's... I correspond with him about once a year. He lives in London. Uh huh. And, and his his wife was a sorority sister of my wife. And she's there too. They're both getting along fine. But uh, I I can't think of a single fraternity brother now who's alive. Wow. So I don't have any. Don't have anybody to reminisce with <laughs> about those things. That's I know that must be difficult. Well, it's not difficult. It's just that you know that's the way it is. I have a half dozen friends from high school that I email with occasionally. Do you still live in Indiana? No, I live in Redmond, Washington. Oh, okay. Where it is now, one thirty. Oh, yes, quite a time difference. We're at 4.30 here. Yeah. Well, um, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me, Carl. Was there anything that you would really like to share? So this, what we'll do is the oral histories, they become part of our archives collection. And if someone's interested in, you know, people who were at Purdue for a certain time period, like in your case, it might be the the late 40s, early 50s, or people who are interested in student life or the history of home economics. There's a variety of different ways, you know, someone might find your interview of interest. So is there anything you'd like to to get on the record before we close today? Well, nothing that I think of. But, you know, if if somebody were to come to you and say, I'm really interested in that period of time on the campus, where could I find out more about it? I would be happy to talk to them. Well, that's wonderful. I think I think that it's really hard for people today to imagine what that was like, and I think that... Well, it is. I found out talking to Elisa, and she was so surprised 
to learn that in 1950-ish, professors wore suits and shirts and ties. Oh, yes. And, and the students wore white shirts and sweaters and like that. And, the, and, you know, there are so many things that are different. We would go, uh, money was, it's hard to imagine the difference in the value of money between then and now. Uh, but you would, uh, you would be very careful about where you spent your, about how you spent your money and conserve. And, and she, she said, well, did you call your folks often? I said, no, because if you called, on the telephone, you had to pay a long distance fee. Oh yes, and that's unheard of now. You know? You're absolutely right. And uh, there just are a lot of things that you don't think of that are very, very different now than they were sixty years ago, sixty-five years ago now. Well, I, I think about the letters that you wrote home and how you know there we have fewer of those today because. Students are so connected with their parents, either by the phone or um, by email or things like that. And, yeah. you know, it's those letters are so valuable because it does tell you exactly what that moment was like. And like you said, you're talking in some of them about the prices for things. And that's really hard for a student today to to realize that, you know, that the cost of things are so different than they used to be. But every student has struggled, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk well, with me. Well, it's been my pleasure, Sammy. Oh, I've enjoyed it. Uh, be interested. I, ha- I have to tell you, you sound so young on the phone that I, I <laughs> Thank e- you. easily could be in your Never. 30s. So I'm going to uh, have this, this added to our collection, and if you're interested... It usually takes us a couple of months. We have students listen to the tapes and and type them up. But I could send you by email the transcript of the interview if you'd like a copy. I'd love it. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Well, I have your email address, and so as soon as it's ready, I'll send that to you. And I just want to thank you again. I I appreciate you making time and helping us add to the the record of the history. I'm I'm happy to help. I think it's a great project you've got going. Where did you, are, are you from Indiana? Or? No, I'm not. I grew up in Louisiana and Texas, and I came here specifically to work at Purdue back in 2003. You did? Yes, so I've been here what forever. What attracted you to Purdue? Well, I always was interested in Amelia Earhart, and they have the Amelia Earhart collection here, and when they advertised for the archivist position, I was working at, at a museum in Dallas, Texas, and I saw the advertisement, and I thought, oh, I'd be really interested in working with Amelia Earhart's collection. So I applied, and I moved from Texas to Indiana, and I've been here ever since. Oh, great. Well, welcome. Welcome as a Hoosier. Well, thank you. I really like it here. I People in the Midwest are so friendly. Like the winters, I suppose. But. You know, I've gotten used to them. I kind of like the snow because we didn't have much of that when I was growing up. Okay. <laughs> then you got it. All well, right, Sammy. Thanks a million. Thank you. You take care. I appreciate it. You too. Bye. Okay. Bye bye.